Hello everyone, it's a beautiful day, it's another exciting edition of ATP Live, we're excited and we're happy to have you, it's been a wonderful year for ATP and thanks to you all for making ATP where we are today. And today we'll be talking about a very interesting topic, something that I am actually very interested in as well, it's ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. And with me is Dr. Bimi Solabuidi. Dr. Bimi is one very passionate person about the survival of every child, not just the Nigerian child. I, I, I envy a passion. <laughs> Dr. Bimi, good morning. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning on Apps of Education Live. And um, yes, the topic we're talking about today is one of those topics that is uh, dear to me because that's one of the uh, my area of specialty. So we're going to be talking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD for short. So thank you so much for joining us, and we encourage you to kindly share this video on your timeline, your friends, your groups, and invite them to come and join us so that they can learn a thing or two. And if you have any questions for me on this topic of ADHD, kindly drop it as comments and then uh, we'll feature it and then we'll be able to answer the questions as much as we have. We have only one hour, so try and make sure you join us early and drop your questions. Yes. So we don't have to start rushing towards the end. Thank you so much. Good morning. All right. Thank you, Dr. Bimi. And I must apologize. Sorry for starting a little bit behind schedule. It was beyond us. So I hope apology has been accepted. All right, we're going to go straight into the topic. But at the same time, I'd like to tell you to please share the video, encourage your friends to come online so they can watch and learn and, you know, and ask their questions, as many questions that you want to ask. Dr. Bim is here to take our question. I remember she said this is our area of specialty. So <laughs> get ready for all your answers. All right, Dr. Bim, ADHD. Can you give us a brief overview well, what exactly is ADHD? Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, so when we talk about ADHD, uh, the full meaning of the word ADHD is 
hypertension, and hyperactivity disorder, and it's a disorder in children. It can also affect adults, but most times we are talking, this is a typical, so we're talking about children So it's a condition that tends to affect children and in, in ways that the children have difficulty with concentration, maintaining attention, and and this and sometimes they could be very apparatic and this will affect them to a certain extent that it will affect their ability to uh, learn in the classroom and also to be able to um, uh, to function in in other settings. So this uh, that that so when a child has this kind of difficulty with maintaining concentration or the child is always very busy, always apparatic. And this feature is significant enough or is impairing that child's ability to be able to um, uh, cope academically or with other in, uh, 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 interaction with family members and or in social settings, then we see that child as attention deficit for activity disorder. I'm trying to avoid using jargons, I'm trying to avoid using medical terminology. <laughs> that can make people confuse, but confuse us. <laughs> exactly. But let me break it down a little bit more. Now, there are certain things that must be present because I see a lot of mothers coming to me and say, oh, this my boy is very very active, very hyperactive. So does he have ADHD and they wonder whether the children have ADHD or not. Uh, let's start saying that it's not every boy who is very active that has ADHD. Understand so, and it is not. And some people think that because girls don't, they are not very hyperactive, always jumping up and down. They don't have ADHD. So those are some of the myths that we often need to so often get rid of. So it is not every hyperactive quote, child that is having ADHD, and it's not every child who does those are always not jumping up and down that has that also does. That means that child doesn't have ADHD. You know, so that that's the first thing. Number two, so um. ADHD can affect both boys and girls, even though it's common in boys and girls, but it can affect both boys and girls. And there are different types of ADHD. So we have what we call the predominantly hyperactive type. So those are the ones that the children are always very active. They jump, and they're always on the go, like the motor is driving them and things like that. They also have the children who have what we call predominantly inattentive type. And this one is the one that tends to get um, mixed or people don't tend to diagnose it because uh, it's not like the children are disturbing and all those kind of things. But the children are often lost in thoughts. They often forget so. so and this is the fact that sometimes we find it very difficult actually to pick up with girls. So you tell them to do something, they forgot it before they left, you know, before they walk for like one minute, they forgot it, then they come back to you, they ask you, sometimes they are they seem to have been lost in thought. Sometimes they seem not to be paying attention, they are forgetting things. And things like that. So those are children with the predominantly inattentive with the children. You also have what we call the combined type. So where the children have both the inattentive and the parasitic ADHD. So there are different types of uh, ADHD. That's another thing we need to understand. And number two, so being forgetful, not concentrating, or being operative on its own does not make a child to have ADHD. Mm -hmm. the, that's uh, those characteristics must impact on the child's function. It will be impairing the child. It will be affecting the child academically and, and all that. Or so it will be affecting the child in terms even for adults, it could be affecting them at work. Or you know, it could be affecting the child's social so it will be impairing the child's everyday life for us to now say the child has anything. And then these features, this behavior pattern must be present in more than two settings for us to say the child has anything. In other words, it is not enough for the child to have it only at home. So there are people that say, oh, some parents will say, oh, this child, the teacher will say, oh, the child is very well behaved at school, very, but the parents will be like, oh, the child is very apparatic. And then sometimes the parents will say it's the other way around, that, oh, the, the child is very well behaved, does it, you know, very quiet, very operative at home, whereas the teachers are having a nice year at school. So it's not the so for, and, and in that case, that means we have to look. We have something present in this environment that is making the child to behave this particular yeah. way. So 
So that is we don't make so for us to make a diagnosis of it, the behavior must be observed by more than two sets inside that we usually we usually look at school and the home environment. We can also look at work environment for adults, we can also look at the culture and things like that. So if so usually when doctors, pediatricians want to make a diagnosis, they will take questionnaires both to the teachers and to the parents. <clears throat> and they must sometimes easily agree before we are really convinced that the child has um, ADHD. So these are the uh, the main uh, features that must be present for us to say child has ADHD. So I see a lot of mothers asking questions. My boy is very hyperactive. He must have ADHD, <laughs> and you know, sometimes like that. And another thing I really need to understand why we're still so just to say you can drop your question, we'll feature it, but I've not seen any questions, so I'll keep on with our. General view. Another thing that we must say about ADHD is the fact that there are lots of developmental disorders, many disorders, and sometimes these disorders look alike. So sometimes parents think that parents like to go for the one that is kind of easier to so, so. <laughs> go with. So I see a lot of children uh, who has other developmental disorder, for example, autism spectrum disorder, and things like that, and parents who say oh, the child has ADHD or even other professional doctors who are not much into development or into developmental pediatrics and aspect and all that, they will say oh, the child has ADHD, whereas the child has autism. So for example, some people say a child is the child is being a parent and all that, then they will now say, Oh, this child has ADHD and the speech delay. Usually most time when you get that kind of miss Combination. combination of diagnosis, most likely that child has autism because usually children with ADHD, they are otherwise normal in terms of their development. So they are not slow talking, they are not slow with other things. So in fact, most times, though you could also have ADHD coexisting with the other uh, developmental so disorder. disorder because in in uh, this field of uh, special, in our specialty of developmental pediatrics, what we call comorbidities, that is two conditions existing together is the norm rather than the exception. In other words, it's common for you to have a lot of children having uh, not just ADHD, but they can have ADHD with, with other things. So yeah, so sometimes it takes a specialist to be able to say, okay, it is this. Sometimes we make a diagnosis of autism, then later we say, oh, the child, in addition to the autism, also has ADHD. Because there are some parts of autism that looks like ADHD as well. The, the behavior pattern can look alike. But you will notice that for children who have the autism and the ADHD, the, the behavior of the ADHD is way far above what you would expect normally for a child with just having all the same spectrum they saw that only yeah so those are the different um uh patterns so uh, uh so if if you are not sure it's better to make sure that you go for a proper evaluation so have a diagnosis of uh, adhd yeah thank you thank you thank you thank you very very interesting all right so don't forget to invite your friends share the video so that they can watch and then ask their questions we're waiting for your questions but before we go there dr bimi i've been hearing about add and adhd is it the same thing or are they different okay yeah add attention deficit is not that the diagnosis of adhd has undergone a lot of um um uh, the name or the terminology itself has undergone a lot of changes over the years. So there's a time we tend to call it ADD, and there's a time we're calling it hyperkinetic disorder. It has had different names over the years, but basically they're all the same. But right now, the accepted terminology is ADHD. Uh, that is attention deficit hyperactivity uh, disorder here. Disorder. Okay. Dr. Penny, I'm a teacher and <laughs> yeah. you experience so many things. You know what? We, we can be so quick to assume that a child, ah, maybe this child has ADHD or ADHD because of you know, their inability to focus or concentrate on the task at the time. I want to ask um, how exactly can we tell or how is it diagnosed? How can we tell that a child has ADHD? Okay, yeah. So I know that most of you that are teachers, you tend to pick up the children a lot more. 
because especially in this uh, M uh, day we are living where most parents don't have that time with the children so they are out in the morning and it is in, uh, the maze or whoever will bring the child to school and things like that so it, it's, it's not unusual for it to be that it is the uh, teachers that tend to see some of this um, uh, behavior pattern so um, uh, to make a diagnosis of ADHD you know, so there must be there are what we call criteria <clears throat> so we have what we call criteria and this criteria is recommended because <clears throat> the diagnosis of ADHD is not like malaria for example so we don't send a blood test to the lab. So we don't send the, there's no blood test, there's no x-ray and things like that. So these are things that are diagnosis that are based on behavior. Now, like I said earlier in the introduction, some of these behavior are normal. So, so for example, a child being hyperactive does not mean the child has ADHD. Generally, boys are a little bit more adventurous than girls. And it's not everybody who is adventurous who like to run up and down and things like that that has ADHD. So because of that, there are certain criteria that must be met. So there are certain things that we must tick and say this child has this, has that, has that, and then it must meet certain number of these criteria under hyperactivity or certain number of these criteria under inattention. And then you must this behavior must be affecting the child in terms of academic performance. So you see a child who has when you do the IQ test for them, they actually have very good IQ, they are very intelligent, but when they in terms of the academic performance, there's a gap. So the teacher thinks this child is very intelligent, but because the child will not complete the work, the child will not finish the work, will, will make silly, silly mistakes and things like that. Then, or the child will not, <clears throat> the child will not do the homework. The child will not return the homework. The child will not even go home with the with the homework and things like that. Then the teacher will, the child will always be scoring lower than what the child's ability is, the capacity of that child is. And then it's on the presence, not only in school, but at home. So we need to have all these criteria checked. And before we can now say, yes, this child has ADHD. So usually we have some, what we call questionnaires, some uh, instruments, we call them, that help us to be able to make um, <clears throat> this diagnosis. So usually we send the questionnaires to the parents. We also send it to the school. And they will collect it. We'll mark. So those questionnaires, they have so many questions, and we ask them in a way that it won't be predictable and all that. So we have different types. We have what we call the Vander base. We have what we call the Kerner questionnaire. The reason why I'm really taking time to explain is that so that when parents, when you get some of these forms or questionnaire from the from the from the pediatrician or yeah. from the school, you don't just assume that. Um, you don't just mm. assume. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> so uh, you don't just assume that the child, uh, you don't just assume why are they disturbing with this question because it is after we finish, uh, it is when we get all those responses back from you and back from the school that we can put it together to make a diagnosis. So it's important that you fill the questionnaires as and as accurately as possible. Sometimes parents are thinking, oh, my child is not this bad. They don't want to, you know, they don't. <laughs> or sometimes even some teachers, when you send them the questionnaires, they, they are being careful not to, uh, they don't want to meet like if they are saying bad things about that child. Oh, it's, not, it's not about saying bad things about this child. It is just about making sure that this child has the right diagnosis and get the right help. So it is better to tell us what it is actually is. Because sometimes you see questionnaire from the parents, everything is zero, everything is perfect. And like, you are wondering, this child that I'm seeing in front of me, <laughs> this child that I'm seeing in front of me cannot be this. I mean, if the child is this good, why is this child um, uh, here in front of me? You understand my point? So it's important that parents fill those questionnaire uh, appropriately uh and so that you know you can you can because sometimes when we don't get the right responses from the parents or from the teachers <clears throat> we will not we will not be confident to make that diagnosis of ADHD but in our own little because we can't make that diagnosis only by our own observation because that child is only with us for maybe one hour 
But if the child is with the parents for more than 24 hours most days, the child is with the teachers more than eight hours, you no know, five days in a week. So they have more opportunity to see the child rather than the pediatrician who is only seeing the child for 30 minutes or one hour max. You understand? So we really need that feedback from the parents and from the it's teachers. The and, parents. Yeah, so to really be able to make that diagnosis. And it's important. So the diagnosis is not is based on those uh the child missing those criteria based on the responses we get from those our uh, questionnaires. That's how to make diagnosis, yeah. All right, thank you, Dr. Bimi. I'm learning a lot, and I hope you're learning something. I want you to keep the questions coming and share the video with your friends and everybody watch. This, you know, this is something that I see almost every day because I'm a teacher, and I've learned so many things, and I'm going to take this thing seriously now. So we'll see these questionnaires will not just fill them for feeling sick, <laughs> we'll fill yeah. them with serious mindedness. Yes, yes, very, very important. Another question, very quickly um, Can ADHD be treated? Yes, of or course. <laughs> yes, so that and that's what we're talking about. Is, thank God it's one of those conditions that can be treated or that can be managed. Okay, and even some of the others that are listening to me, some people have ADHD. Let me just say by number, before I go into the treatment, I forgot to mention that earlier is the fact that the ADHD usually, uh, we don't know the cause of ADHD per se, but we think it has genetic, um, uh, uh, there's some genetic association with it. In fact, majority of the time in children with ADHD, uh there's always a probability that there's either the father or the mother also has ADHD or there's usually there's a family history of ADHD as well so <laughs> I've had instances where parents bring their children to us for diagnosis of ADHD and you can even see <clears throat> from the way the mom or the you know that they also have ADHD and some of them are actually very honest about it and say yes this guy was a lot like me when I was also at this age but because you know as adults they've learned how to kind of learn how to manage them but most of us we know this of our friends that we know that I think have ADHD. so there's always some genetic part of it um but we also know it's associated with things like maternal smoking uh babies that are born preterm and things like that there are lots of all taken up all during pregnancy and things like that but we don't really have like this is a specific thing that causes ADHD but the one that we are very sure about is that it's mostly inherited. So usually we always ask, is there any other person in the family who has this uh, diagnosis? So that's how, that's about the cause of ADHD, because I know some people may be interested in that. And then, uh, then going on, we talk about the, you're asking me about the treatment. So the first thing is for us to know, to confirm the diagnosis of ADHD, because there are so many things, like I said, that can look like ADHD. For example, children who have sensory impairments, for a child, a child who is blind, or a child who is deaf, sometimes they look like um, uh, they, they are not paying attention, but sometimes people don't know that it's because the child could not hear. So usually we normally like to do hearing tests. Or sometimes a child is not concentrating or a child is acting out in class, then because the child could not see the board very clearly and the child just think, oh, let me just disturb them as a way of <laughs> getting true, back. True. You know? So those yeah. are some things that we need to rule out. Sometimes some children who has inattention, um, uh, inatte uh, what we call uh, absence seizure, there are some children that tend to look as if they are not concentrating, they just kind of zoned out and all that. Some of them actually have seizures. Yes, they're actually having seizures. There's what we call absence seizures. And it could really look like inattentive ADHD. But you see that the child will but the child will be talking, for example, and just pause in the middle of the sentence and then just go on. Um and then after a while, just continue as if nothing happened, and you wonder what happened to the child. Or the child is just and this can happen several times in a in a in a role in a, in a day. And so that child is missing out in between what the teacher is saying. So the child does not have a you know. So those kind of children may have seizures that require treatment. So these are things that look like ADHD, but they are not ADHD. And of course, I've mentioned that other problems like autism and things like that, they can also look like as if the child has ADHD. Because some of them come up with behavior issues, but it's not necessarily ADHD. No, they can also have ADHD in addition to all things. In children with intellectual disability at times, because what you're saying is really above their head, you know, they don't really understand. So that's why one of the things we also check when you're doing diagnosis is also to do the children's um, 
psychological assessment, to, psychometric assessment to know their level of uh, intelligence and things like that. Anyway, so we not, we need to be very, very sure that this is ADHD and not any of those uh, what we call differential diagnosis or the look-alike of ADHD. So that's the first thing we do. So after we've convinced ourselves that this child has ADHD, what in terms of the management, we have um, uh, what we call the behavioral management patients or, or pharmacological or drugs management mm -hmm. and let me say the first thing is that we don't the, the first thing is not to go into drugs you know because even those parents always think oh just give him something so that that will be calm and all that but you know in addition to the even when you're using drugs you still need those behavior management so parents training is one of the first thing we do we need the parents to understand what ADHD is all about. We need the parents to understand uh, why the child is doing what the child is doing and things like that. So it's very, very important. So parents need to understand ADHD, why the child has ADHD, what are the features of ADHD, how does the brain of an ADHD child work, how do you handle it, how do you get them to behave properly. So behavior management, parents have to be trained. So there's always, and there are a lot of usually uh, groups, support groups for parents of children with ADHD, or people that teach them about behavior management, parents training, par parenting classes, and things like that. It's very, 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 very helpful. And sometimes some children with that alone, they may not even require uh, any form of um, medication because with the behavior management, they'll be fine. And teachers also need to be part of that behavior management. So usually we, we tell the teachers as well. So they also, so and what is what is the baseline of that behavior is that you try to, what are those things that your the children are doing that you really want to uh, get, to, want them to get over? over. So you, 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 you don't make too many goals. You can just say, okay, let me address three. Okay, maybe the child is always interrupting you during the classroom, or the child is not finishing his homework, you know, or the child is getting things lost. So you can decide to address a few of them at, at a time. And then you, usually the way we do is that we, we reward good behavior. We can tell the child, if you're able to, you know, do this, so, so if you're able to finish your own work so, so number of times, then you get this reward. The reward daily reward, the weekly reward, there are, uh, rewards, long time rewards, and all that, mm -hmm. and then you try to encourage the child. And also, when the child doesn't do it right there, so you, the child may lose some privileges. And so, I'm just giving us an idea of how we go about behavior management. But we make it short, and then we can graduate it. For example, there are also some modification teachers can make in the classroom. For example, a child with ADHD is the child that you want to sit very close to you in the class. That should not be the child that should sit at the back or near the windows <laughs> where they can sit. <laughs> <laughs> where they can still be distracted. So you want them sitting very close to you. Sometimes when you give them responsibility, you make them the assistant teacher or assistant captain or something like that. It helps them to kind of control their behavior better. So those, those are some of those uh, behavioral strategies that parents, teachers can use to help children with ADHD. But sometimes, even with that, it may not be enough. And then you really need to use medication. So we have what we call medication for ADHD. And we have what we call, there are different types. We have what we call the stimulant medication, like Ritalin and all that. Then you also have the non-stimulants and, and all that medication. I, I know there are lots of misconceptions. Some people parents are worried about medication, the side effect, that it will make the child look different. So, so but usually when we start seeing medication, the pediatricians will be with the child, will be walking through. Usually we start with very low dose of those medications. And sometimes parents are also very impatient because you start with a small dose, they've not seen any difference, then they start guessing out. The medication doesn't work, they're going to throw it away. No, you need to be patient because some, what we, what, for this kind of condition, most times the drugs is not according to their weight or anything, it's according to their response. So we, we usually will start very slow and then we'll gradually increase it until we get what works for you. So a smaller child may need a higher dose. It doesn't matter. Whereas a bigger child may just even need a small dose. So it is according to the response of the child. And those drugs doesn't mean that the child has to take them for life. It doesn't mean the child will have to take them for life. So sometimes during the holidays, we can stop the medication and see whether the child is, is able to control their behavior. Remember, we are not just only doing medication. We are doing medication with the behavior management. And the behavior management is very important. Behavior management is important for everybody. We all need to know how to organize ourselves. We all need to know how to do time management. Just that for children with ADHD, they need this even more than the average child. So whatever behavior strategies you use even for your children with ADHD, 
it will be very helpful even for children without ADHD as well. So these are the ways by which we manage ADHD. And of course, the doctors, and sometimes some children with time, they learn how to manage themselves. So they may not even need medication, but some may need it during the period, maybe when they want to have their exams and they really need to have lots more concentration. And another challenge with the drugs with ADHD is that they are, they are drugs that can easily be abused. And because some people abuse them, some drug people, you know, they take them. So because of that, they are very regulated drugs. And sometimes they are not easily available. This is a major, major challenge for those of us in, in, the, in this part of in, in, in South Saharan Africa. Because the drugs are very regulated, it's very difficult. So most pharmaceutical companies don't want to stop them. But they are beginning to get them. So um, that's good. So just to know so that parents don't get discouraged if they're having difficulty getting the drugs well, with your pediatrician support so you can always get it so the best pediatrician to see if you think your child has ADHD is a developmental pediatrician or the pediatric neurologist those are the people that can really really assist you all right <laughs> thank you dr Bumi. this is very educative i am learning a lot and i hope you are We're waiting for your questions okay good we have some Questions already. We are not really having questions. We are having comments. I, I don't know whether there are questions okay. on the watch party. On the watch party, okay. Um, for, our, for our moderators on the watch party, kindly, if there are questions, please help us yes. to, because we can only see questions drop directly on the video. I have a feeling there may be questions on the watch party that we can't say. So if there are questions, you can, because I've not seen anybody drop. <laughs> you know, one thing, Dr. Bailey, this ADHD is not. It's not a really known term. I got to know about it, okay, maybe because I'm a teacher mm -hmm. and then we we'll attend conferences, we've had, you know, to deal with children that we sometimes suspect have these things. Yeah. Um, going on that thing, Dr. Bimi, um, we, we had someone talk about the diet of the child. Okay. Do you think their diet, you know, affects them in one way or the other? We've had, we've had to tell parents, cut down this boy's sugar, you know, cut down just to help keep them calm. Does it yeah. affect them in any way or does it really matter? Yeah. Okay, Th thank you so much, Akpai. That's a very valid question and I'm happy that you brought it up because we do get that a lot. And um, uh, generally speaking, children, the more sugar you pump into them, the more they are hyperactive. And that's one of the reasons why we say don't, um, parents should do more of uh, healthy diets in terms of packing their children lunch boxes, all these fruit juice, all these juice, so-called juice that we, we <laughs> always buy in stores and all that. Most of them are just sugar, loaded sugar. And you see, when you put sugar into the body, it has to be bumped up. So that's why the children get hyper, kind of, when they are on sugar. So ADHD on its own has nothing to do with the diet per se, but you cannot imagine even with an, a, a neurodevelopmentally typical child, in other words, a child who doesn't have ADHD, if you give them too much sugar, they want to burn it out. So they tend to become hyper. So you cannot imagine a child who already has uh, uh, mm -hmm. ADHD, then you now load them with too much sugar. Of course, they are going to want to burn off that energy until they become more hyperactive. So usually, generally, healthy choices for children generally, whether ADHD or no ADHD, is to Lower the amount of white sugar or sugary uh, food, fluids, or juices, or all these uh, products that we normally give them. We need to reduce and let them take normal uh, fruits. Let them get the sugar from normal food, from normal, not the artificially uh, uh, loaded sugar, you know, products that we tend to give them. So, so we really need to make sure that we. That's what we should be doing. So, diet should be healthy diets, but. Not so much, no sugar, no, no added extra uh, loaded sugar uh, uh, containing product. Yeah. All right. I think okay. we need to have some questions now. Okay. Okay. This is a question from from the watch party. Yeah. Thank you, Vera. When do you refer a child for ADHD for occupational therapy? Okay. So, children with um, ADHD may need. Occupational therapy, if they have what we call some uh, fine motor issues, and uh, there's uh, there's what we call there's another condition that they call developmental coordination disorder. In other words, these children 
their handwriting will be very poor. They, they, will, they will not be able to do some activities, some of the sports activities. They are very clumsy. All that. So the, AD, I mean, the occupational therapy tends to help them with those aspects of their behavior. Now, it's very important especially for those of us in Nigeria because we don't have so many of these professionals working with the children. And so because of that, people sometimes they are confused who, and then any child who has any form of developmental disorder, whatever, people just send them to any professional they think yeah. they can send them to. And it's very important that people should understand who should be seeing each child. Number one, the first person to see any child with any developmental disorder whatsoever is the pediatrician, preferably the developmental pediatrician or pediatric neurologist. So those are the ones that should be seeing this children because they need to make a diagnosis. Most of the therapies don't make diagnosis. The therapies manage the children, yes, but they don't usually make diagnosis. And like, remember what I said at the beginning, that some of these disorders, they tend to look alike. Sometimes they may coexist. So it is important that the, the pediatrician see the children at the beginning to recommend that. Because I, in my profession, I've seen a lot of children who have been seen by different kind of professionals and the, the parents are kind of frustrated. And, and because at the beginning, each professional, actually in our, uh, well, let's just say in a, in a country where things are not very well regulated, you can have this, I mean, different, everybody wants to make their money. So they will see the children, even if it doesn't really need to be seen by them. But most times this year will require almost all the professionals. So, but the best person to offer see a child with ADHD is the pediatrician. Now, if the child, pediatrician evaluates the child and the child needs some motor, has some motor difficulties, what there are some conditions that coexist with ADHD, we call them comorbidity, comorbidities. Like, for example, children with ADHD can also have fine motor difficulties. Children with ADHD can also have sleep difficulties. Some of them can have oppositional deviant behavior. Some of them can have seizure disorder. There are different things, intellectual disability, so many things that can coexist. But the pediatrician is the one that will know this is the original diagnosis, this is the comorbidities, these are the professionals that should be involved. So it is the pediatrician that can now refer, okay, the child needs OT, the child needs speech therapy, whatever. So that's what I will say about that. So uh, your pediatrician will decide when you need to see your professional therapist. All right, thank you. I hope you've heard that. Okay, this is another question from Samson Jurujai. Is there any tablets for children with ADHD? <laughs> Yes, we've mentioned that. So children with ADHD have medications. So we have different medications that but these are regulated drugs. These are not even drugs most yeah. doctors would prescribe. It's a specialist that tend to prescribe them. So if you think your child has ADHD, see your pediatrician first, then the pediatrician will recommend the appropriate treatment. And usually those treatments usually don't give you for more than a month. So yeah, you have to come back for because it's it has to be well regulated so that it doesn't fall into the hand of those who abuse. Uh, such medication. medication. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bimi. This is from Maureen. God bless you, ma. Thank you. Um, is ADHD common with DS babies? I think she meant Down syndrome babies. Okay, so okay. babies with Down syndrome can also have ADHD. Um, yeah, it's, I won't say it is very, very common in them. I think it's just like just like in any other, the, the, okay, we didn't talk about how common ADHD is. Uh, it's affect about 5% yes. of who a children. In fact, ADHD is the most common developmental disorder among school age children. And that is why the teachers are going to pick them up. It's the most common developmental disorders in school age children. So 5% of children, 5 to 10% of school children will have ADHD. And the truth is that we don't make enough diagnosis of ADHD. We don't. We are under diagnosis. We are under treating the children because most of what well, in Nigeria, most of those behavior, we just say it as the child being naughty, as the child playing pranks, and whereas the child may actually have ADHD. And it, but I think because of our own style of also the way we treat children, I think somehow we are always implementing the behavior strategies, even though we may not know. It's just that sometimes for some children, even with all those behavior strategies. It, do not work and those kind of those are the kind of children that will end up needing to see the pediatrician for medication because even with all the strategies the teachers are putting in place they are not working you know because most teachers also know how to use some strategies even without necessarily um having a diagnosis that this child has it they just do their normal teacher oh this child is having behavior you should do that to undo it and it works for most children it works but some children need more than that and those are the kind of children that will end up uh being without Thank you so much, Maureen, for your question. Okay. 
Another question from Oile. Ma, please, my daughter of 12 years has been going through serious tummy pains for weeks now. We have done all necessary tests, including scan. He's referring to menstruation. Can it be that? It's okay. Dr. Baby. Yeah, it is possible. Yeah, even though it's not okay. physically related. Um, yeah, Oyele, oh, yeah, it's possible. And even sometimes children can have uh, what we call functional abdominal pain, whereas they don't really have any. Uh, there's really nothing causing it, but it's possible. So I think you should not just worry. You know? Worry. Mm. Hey, Oyi Goji, I'm wondering if this is related to being very assertive and tendering towards disobedience. Okay, Maybe so uh, Oyi, yeah, I'm sure you're just joining us. Thank you for joining us. So like I said at the beginning, we don't just see a behavior and label the child ADHD. You know, I was explaining that very, uh, that's why it took time to explain that. It, it, the little child doesn't necessarily have ADHD. The child who's been assertive doesn't necessarily have ADHD. For, you, for us to make a diagnosis of ADHD, the child must have six out of nine symptoms of hyperactivity, six and or six out of nine symptoms of inattention. These symptoms must be present in more than two settings at home or at, and at school. And these symptoms must have been on for more than six months. And then these symptoms will be affecting the child academically or in terms of interaction with peers and things like that and these symptoms we cannot explain it by any of the other developmental disorders so we are really there are really very strict um uh, uh criteria for you to make a diagnosis of it so every child who is assertive will not necessarily the child may be assertive with you at home may not be assertive with the teacher in school and that may not necessarily affect the child academically so that child will not be said to have ADHD. So for you to even make a diagnosis of it, it, is, it goes beyond the behavior. The behavior must be impairing the child. It must be affecting the child in terms of the child's performance at school. So if the child who is underperforming at school, when we do the IQ, the child has very nice IQ skills. But when the child, when, then the teacher, gives, you know, and the child is, so these are the kind of children that fail exams. And But when you the teacher now sit down with them, they actually know the, the, the world, but because they are very careless, they don't take the time, they are very dis they are distracted, they, they will not finish the school work, so they will underperform. But the teacher knows that the child has the ability, but the child is underperforming. That This is when you actually make the diagnosis of ADHD, because this is not just a behavioral thing now. This is a behavioral thing that is now impacting and impairing the child's uh, life, daily life, uh, you know. So that is, so we, we, should, so we, we don't just easily make those diagnoses just because I can't see a child in five minutes and make a diagnosis of ADHD now. We have to make that diagnosis with all the uh, information from school, from teachers, and with all these criteria will be checked. So we don't just see any child who is being disobedient as that ADHD or a child who is that. No, we don't, we don't, we don't do yeah, it must be affecting the child in a negative way for us to say yes. It's okay, okay, thank you, Dr. Yeah. Thank you. We don't have any more questions. Please, we're still here. Dr. Baby is still in the house. Don't forget to send your questions, share the videos so that you can have other people benefit from this video. Okay? Um, Dr. Baby. Yeah. ADHD. Um, I'm, you know, as we're talking, I'm trying to relate with the children I work with, and if perchance we miss that a child actually has ADHD and it's not managed or treated, does it have any other effects besides, okay, not coping academically or... Yeah, yes, yes, I, I'm happy you asked that question. Now, why do we need to talk about ADHD? Why do we need to make a diagnosis? Why do we need to treat these children? Because there is yes. what we call, it can have long-term consequences. So most children with ADHD that are not diagnosed, they are the ones that end up doing all the risky behaviors because they are underperforming in school. They end up being school dropouts. They end up experimenting. They are the one that would like to experiment with drugs, smoking, marijuana taking, and all that use of everything. They are the one because of the, the ADHD tendency. They are the one that will engage in risky sex and get, you know, they will not use condom or use uh, other protection. They are the one that will likely get pregnant and try uh, experimental abortion. So those kind of so when children don't get diagnosed and treated. 
they it yeah. affect them long term. So they drop out of school, they end up being, you know, in quotes, miscreants, they end up falling into the wrong groups because they're easily pushed into doing the wrong things. They end up getting pregnant, having abortion. So if the moment their life can be cut short, number two, they end up most of these area boys or most of these um uh social miscreants, most of them actually have ADHD when they were in school that were not diagnosed. So they and if you see the way they behave, you know that they don't they are not able to process things properly. Yeah. So this that this is a problem with ADHD because if you don't handle those children, they um, unfortunately what they end up becoming things that they don't want to be. And even when they become adults, they are the one that will change their jobs. They tend to they are fired easily from job because they'll be late to work, they will not meet up with their targets and things like that. And you know, because adults also have ADHD. And if they don't know how to manage it, you see they, they will be changing jobs and they will not have references. So they'll they will end up having uh, a life that is really not, I mean, that they are not able to get to the to fulfill their potential, let me put it that way. And so that's why it's important that ADHD is diagnosed and treated and and when the child are young, uh, they are senior, when children are young, so that they don't end up becoming, or, I mean, have, becoming this, uh, all this, uh, um, all these things I've mentioned already. I, I don't want to use negative derogatory words. So, but it has very long term impact and that's, why, yes. and that's why it's important that we handle it right now yeah this part you just mentioned is very scary like yeah, yeah. Just that's assume... that's yeah okay this is from emmanuela my daughter of four months can stand on one lap is it normal or should i be worried no your baby should not be standing at four months anyway so just let the baby alone yeah. nothing to worry about all right, let's keep the questions coming. It's still ADHD and it's still Dr. Bimmy, and it's still an area of specialty. So don't miss out asking your questions. All right, Felicia, this is from Felicia. Yeah, okay, Felicia, from the watch party. Like Please, do kids, yes, you and Please, do kids outgrow autism or ADHD without medication? Okay, now this is very, <laughs> this is a very mm. difficult one to answer. So, generally speaking, in um in developmental pediatric, we don't talk about the children outgrowing the diagnosis, but we can see that the children can overcome their challenges. I'm trying to choose my words carefully. So if a child has ADHD or a child has autism, it's a, it's a lifelong diagnosis, they have that diagnosis. But the children can overcome the difficulties that they have. In other words, so a child with autism, for example, how do we make diagnosis of autism? A child has difficulty with communication, social communication, social interaction. The child can learn to talk, the child can learn to socially interact. So the child has to overcome all those difficulties. But the child will still have the diagnosis of autism. They may still always have some features once in a while, you know, that help you to know that they, but they can manage it, they can control it. The same thing with ADHD. Somebody with ADHD can learn how to manage themselves, they can learn how to control themselves, they can learn how to, to do things properly, and they may not need medication. Yes, they don't need medication, but they, 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 they will always know that, oh, I have that ADHD tendency, but I just have known how to manage it. So if you if is that what you meant by all oh, outgrow, yes, that then you can say yes, but it is important for them to know that they have this diagnosis and they are still putting in all those measures to uh to deal with these challenges that those who have those diagnoses may have that's very important but they can actually outgrow or ask uh, um overcome their challenges that's the way i like to challenges. okay all right thank you Dr. Bim. this is from allow me please my girl child of two years has not started talking please is this normal Okay, Dr. Bimmy, two-year-old. Yes, it's not normal for a two-year-old not to be talking. If a one-year-old child should have one to three words, and a two-year-old child should be putting two words together to form phrases like mommy, hey, mommy, biscuit, this kind of thing. So if a two-year-old is not talking at all, then it's important that you take that child to see either a pediatrician or a speech therapist. Number one, we need to offer evaluate the child, and then most likely, the job is speech delay. Some children have speech delay without any other thing, then the child will need speech therapy. Sometimes the child may have autism. So one of the, the most important things to rule out in a two-year-old who is not talking 
with autism spectrum disorder, we need to really rule it out. So that's the first thing to do. And if there is autism, then we can start early intervention for the child. So um, allow me, I will encourage you to see, you can see your pediatrician, then your pediatrician can <coughs> do, <coughs> excuse me, can do the appropriate uh, referral for you. Thank you. Thank you, Laomi. I hope you've heard that. Okay, do we have more questions? Okay, as we're going through today's topic, Dr. Bini, I just remembered I had a friend back in school. She always had this um, tension ball or pressure ball, I don't know. And she was just, yeah. it's all, it's around, like, it's everywhere. Like yeah. she, and she's so smart, she's very intense. She hardly talks, but when she gets angry, she can destroy the whole house. So she said she went for therapy and then they just told her to keep squeezing the ball when she's angry, breathe, and it helped her. I mean, throughout the four years in school, she, she didn't act up. You know, can we say she had <laughs> ADHD or it was just an anger it, issue? It's so hard just, to say because I can think of possible things that she has, um, but it's, it would be unfair to say what she has without having all the information. But I, I would think most likely it's possible she is on the autism spectrum. Yeah, so because usually they have this, um, um, they may have some sensory processing difficulties and that's why they need to have things like balls, something they can hold in their hands and things like that. But it's so hard to say what it is without, exactly. you know, because you are only reporting what you know. There are maybe other oh, yeah. things that, you know, you don't yeah. know. So we can't make a retrospective that oh, sure. I can only assume that maybe she may have it may be on the spectrum, but you know, it's not every child with autism spectrum that is very uh, not talking or not interacting at all. It's a spectrum. So some people on the mild end of the spectrum, you will not even know they have anything wrong with them, but you just notice that there's a little bit some awkward way they do their thing, but they are still, uh, they will still function properly. You know, I'm just assuming, but it's difficult to say what it is. Okay, I think uh, our time is almost up. So we have just two more questions. Then we we'll take that, and then we can <laughs> we can close the show for go today. On, on. Yeah. Okay. okay, this is from you, and Whatever is for, and she's at five. She has normal growth, and she has speech delay, and screams a lot. My question is this: Is she autistic or having ADHD? She's okay, okay. Um, you, uh, Andy. I cannot make a diagnosis just based on <laughs> two, three sentences. Like, it's very important. I, I have an idea of what is to be wrong. I will think more of yeah, autism. Like I told them, um, uh, was an uh, at the beginning of the program that if a child has speech delay, it's a very strong uh, flag, a red flag for it's more of autism. Yeah. A child who has speech delay, who is now screaming or having all those behavioral issues that I talk about. We need to refer for evaluate for autism. Usually, children with ADHD have normal development. They don't have any speech delay. In fact, they talk too much, and they interrupt people's speech and all that. that, that that's even their own. Uh, you can't get them to keep quiet. So I would rather think more. Of that. But like I said, a child can have both autism and ADHD as well. So um, one day, I really think you must see a pediatrician. Your child must be evaluated and your child must be treated properly. So if you have not started, you didn't tell us how old your child is and things like that, but I really think you should get your child evaluated properly. Uh, if you are in Nigeria, you can send us a, a message, um, email or something that we can see where we can refer you to. If you are, if you are in Lagos, you can go to Luz. At least we do some assessment there. Some other, uh, I think, uh, some other centers also do. Some of the centers that do treatment for the children also do assessment as well. But any of the teaching hospitals, preferably Lutz, at least I can speak for Lutz because that was where I was working before. They will to assess your child for you. Okay, our last question for today. Um, okay, this is for Blessing and Daisy. This, can we have a questionnaire for ADHD on the group page? Um, <laughs> you, um, the questionnaire for ADHD, some are in public domain, some are not in public domain. But it is not the questionnaire is not even the problem. I mean, the questionnaire doesn't make any difference because it has to be interpreted by a pediatrician. So even if we put the questionnaire for you, um, doesn't mean 
we are not you, you can't make a diagnosis just by finding the questionnaires the, the, the pediatrician has to collect the questionnaire from the school from the teachers and have to interpret it but if you want to get a hold you can just go that um you can search for adhd questionnaires uh vanderbilt questionnaires i think the one for the one by the american um uh, academy of pediatrics aap uh, they have the vanderbilt i think it's available it's, uh, it's in public domain you can just use it but I'm not sure whether you can interpret it online. So you can just go. There are lots of, uh, there's also chat. There's a lot of um, websites for parents about ADHD. So if you want to get questionnaires. But training uh, the questionnaires require a clinician who will coordinate everything and arrive at the diagnosis. All right, but it's available. I think some are in public domain. Even if you just want you to have an idea of what I'm talking about and how to make diagnosis, yes, it's fine. You can check it out. Just one the big questionnaires or just go with the age questionnaires. You will come across some of them and you have an idea. Okay, okay, the last one. <laughs> okay, uh, my question my daughter of one year, three months can't walk yet, can't talk, and have 10 seats. Is it normal? Okay. One year, three months. You said can talk. Hey, one year, three months not working. Can't walk for years, can't talk. Yeah, but your baby is fine. There's nothing wrong with your baby. Uh, usually, if your baby is not working by 18 months, then you see a baby. Usually, we will not worry on baby's 18 months. 18 okay, months. fine. We're done for the day. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much for <laughs> everyone who joined us this morning. Uh, we've talked about ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I just want to say that parents, if you think your child has any developmental disorder generally, please don't be in denial. Generally, for developmental disabilities or disorder, the earlier we make a diagnosis, the better for the children. The earlier we start intervention, the better for the children. And like Okwe was asking me, and I, 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 I rightly said, um, the, uh, the, uh, the long-term consequence of these undiagnosed conditions can be very disastrous. We don't want these children, actually, when they get to the teenage years, Children with ADHD in the teenage years, they are, and they are not on treatment, they are not on any form of support, they tend to have lots of difficulties. They tend to, they are the ones that will experiment with drugs, they are the ones that will experiment with smoking, they are the ones that end up being school dropouts, they are the ones that can get sexually transmitted infections and things like that. You know, so we really need to make sure that it doesn't have to be drugs, even if it's just the behavior management, they need them, they and they need all this support so it is very very important that we get them all the right support so if you think your child based on all this discussion may have adhd kindly take them to see a pediatrician preferably in any of our teaching hospitals and then they'll be able to uh, give you the right support uh, make a diagnosis if, if it's just behavior management they will tell you if it's required medication don't be scared of the medication they will monitor the, the medication they will monitor the side effects and then the most important thing and like i said if the children overcome these challenges they may not need to take the drugs for life and they can be uh out of the um and they can be able to function as responsible citizens and responsible adults but they really need to have the right diagnosis and the right approach as soon as possible so thank you so much yeah that's my take home message <laughs> all right thank you dr Benny. it's been a very very educative one it's i must confess i have learned a lot and i'm sure you have you know and and i hope and pray that we'll be able to walk and deal with these things when we need to as fast as possible dr Benny, final words before we go yeah, just to say that uh, thank you so much for everyone who joined us this morning we apologize a little bit of technical each at the beginning but we overcome that um if you after the live show because some people will come and watch this video after the live show please drop your questions for us on our group not under the video because after we we cannot easily come back to answer questions drop after the live show so if you have questions ask on adhd or question generally on anything child health issues uh, go to our group. If you go to Facebook and just type Ask the Pediatricians, you will see Ask the Pediatricians Facebook group. And then you can 
we'll be able to answer uh you can drop your question there i can see you're yes, saying we've not answered your question i'm not sure we've seen your question maybe your question didn't drop if your question didn't drop you can now take it to the group it be easier for our moderators and our professionals and our group to answer your questions there so kindly go to to www.facebook.com slash groups slash ask the page when you get into the group join our group then you can drop your questions you, you will get you will get immediate and faster response to your questions and also on our pages we as much as possible we don't want you to be dropping questions on the page or on on the videos or on our pictures because it, we it's very difficult for us to track those kind of questions but if you go to our group and you drop your questions there from monday to saturdays we answer your questions 24 hours we are online to answer your questions we don't answer questions on sunday and so you, you so don't be frustrated if you think oh i can't drop questions on sunday we don't answer questions on sunday but monday to saturdays 24 7 you i mean 24 hours <laughs> every day on those days you can drop your questions and we answer them and if you have an emergency please don't drop questions that are emergencies you such questions please uh take it to the hospital we are an health education uh, platform and health information platform we don't treat children we don't make diagnoses we don't undo emergencies i mean you also know that it's impossible for us to do that on the on 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 the online, online. <laughs> yeah so kindly take your children to the hospital in such instances but thank you so much and if you want to support active pediatrician foundation if you want to advertise on our program you're welcome if you want to sponsor ETP life you're welcome just send us an email at axipediatricians at gmail.com axipediatricians at gmail.com and we will tell you how you can be part of this program or how you can support us or how you can advertise on our program and if you want to watch our past videos of all the ATP life we've done previously we have a youtube channel so you go to youtube and look for axi pediatricians i think it's www.youtube.com slash axi pediatricians it will land you in our axi pediatrician channel and you can watch our videos you can also watch it on our page you can watch it on our groups but i think if you don't want you just want the video itself you can just go to the youtube uh, uh kindly subscribe to our youtube channel and you watch all our previous atp live videos and you can learn a lot from it so thank you so much for joining us this morning. Have a nice weekend. Right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Benny. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah. The rest of your weekend. And see you next week at 10 a.m. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.